Okay. We are live and recording. But uh, I'll tell you what, let's uh, let's wait until uh, we get some more folks in the room or if we hear from the judge, uh, if he's going to be able to join us. And uh, otherwise, we can just have a, have a quick discussion uh, ourselves and uh, maybe grab some clips from it. Absolutely fine. Cool. Welcome, Thomas. Welcome, Turkey. Thanks for joining us. Welcome, Ralph. We'll give it just a minute for anybody else who wants to join, and then we'll launch into our discussion. Okay, gentlemen, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, out of respect for everyone's time, I think we want to just go ahead and get started. Uh, we're joined here at the Horaceous Global Meeting uh, by Armand Arden, uh, who's the founder of the Global Citizen Forum, uh, for a discussion on overcoming populism. And uh, I think these discussions really are at their best uh, when there's a lot of participation. Uh, everybody's here because, you know, they... they have an impact of this subject on their life, uh, whether it's as somebody who's involved in international business, uh, somebody who's a concerned citizen, uh, or even just as a consumer of media. Overcoming populism is something that we've all got to think about, uh, and it's going to become a very important topic uh, in history uh, as the months and years continue here uh, with the world recovering, hopefully, uh, from the pandemic. And so uh, Armand has had a, a great career, and a great leadership, uh, in international business, uh, international investment, and really advancing the concept of what it means to be a global citizen. Uh, he's an advisor to governments uh, and a very thoughtful individual. And uh, I'm looking forward to asking him uh, a few questions to kick off the discussion. But certainly, uh, if there's topics or questions that folks in the audience have, uh, we want to make sure that we have a, an active discussion, uh, come away with a stronger framework for dealing with populist uh, movements and what leaders can do uh, to lead to a better future. So with that, let me hand over uh, to Armand for a second uh, to introduce uh, himself, his work, uh, and then we'll get into some questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Abraham. Um, and welcome to everybody else who is listening from across the world. Um, as uh, Abraham introduced me, I uh, have set up a company called Arts and Capital that over the last 15 years many governments and migration issues. And uh, over the last uh, 10 years, we have uh, started the Global Citizen Forum, which is a, a nonpartisan platform um, membership community uh, with top leaders, governments, NGOs that are focusing on global mobility and the five pillars that surround this topic from governance to migration, security, technology, and culture. Um, so the topic of popularism is something that is very close to our heart and close to our mission because um, it is in the news over the last 10 years and migration is one of the topics that has been really used by uh, um, this kind of movement from the left or the right um, and we have always felt the need of uh, reshuffling this view and this paradigm on, on migration and, and how this what it means for, for society. Uh, so popularism is uh, on the rise, as you have seen, and the pandemic has really accelerated, I believe, um, and polarized the world really on, on the two extreme uh, by really leaving an empty uh, space in, uh, in anything that is central in terms of governments. Uh, we see that in Europe, in, in the States, uh, many parts of the world. So it is worrying for us as concerned citizens, as global citizens, where we do have a responsibility to talk about some of the issues. And migration is something that will only increase in terms of impact um, from the climate change, from the political instability around the world. So if we think that we have a political migration crisis today, um, well, we're gonna live with that for the next 25 years and our kids will be dealing with something that will be even more important uh, probably five to ten times larger migration flows than what we see today. Um, so we cannot allow populism to use migration the way it's been used 
Kiko reasons, gain power, retain powers, um, scare people. Um, and I'm very happy to talk about, uh, about this issue with uh, Abraham and with all of you. So feel free to pop any questions and, and views, um, your own concerns. And uh, what do you think is the solution? Wonderful. Well, that's a, that's a great way to uh, frame up the discussion. Uh, I'd like to ask just a couple of questions that you know, personally uh, I'm very curious about, very interested in uh, your perspective. And uh, definitely if there's folks in the audience uh, who'd like to contribute and guide the discussion, uh, that's, that's extremely welcome as well. But, but let, me, let me actually ask this question first. Uh, I know the subject of the session is overcoming populism, uh, but I think, and, and you've already alluded to, you know, we might want to be a little bit more nuanced than that. And, uh, you know, I, I know that uh, there's all kinds of challenges that, that arise from, uh, you know, populist movements, but I wanted to see if there's anything that you think that these movements are right about, uh, anything that you think is kind of valid in their worldview or their perspective, or anything that you think, you know, is kind of the, the cause of uh, some of these movements to be arising in the way and with the intensity that they are uh, at, this, at this moment in time. Well, I believe that from economic crisis to uh, pandemics, um, every crisis it's um, it's a fuel for for populism, and and this is what uh, we're we're witnessing. Uh, you know, make America great uh, again is um, you know it, it was a famous uh, and became a very famous uh, line in the last uh, five years. Uh, there are some benefits, and and there is a lot of countries who are seeing the benefit of. Um, looking you know internally within the country in, in terms of growth and who are against globalization um, but again this is a very short term uh, zoom in view and uh, for any leader that uh, is here to stay uh, he needs to zoom out and he needs to look at, at, at the bigger picture uh, not the next five years but the next 50 years and and um, this is where I believe the, the the benefits populism are diluting with the zoom out picture of the world, and they're benefiting if you zoom in into a specific one year or a quarter or five years following a crisis um, from economic, political, migration crisis. Um, it's, it's very easy for them to identify a populist solution to short term problems, but not in the long term. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, so yeah, I think I think that's a that's a that's a great way to think about it. Uh, short term versus long term. Uh, you know, one one thing I think we just happen to be at this moment in history uh, where you know we're a few generations removed from you know the the foundation of uh, the post World War II order, and you know that kind of creates enough time in a lot of uh, countries and a lot of uh, systems for some challenges to set in. That uh, you know maybe systems were working very well in the beginning, uh, but you know a few generations removed, they're not doing exactly what they were designed to do in quite the same way. Or there's some externalities uh, that have been emerging that um, you know people are upset about. And uh, you know the, the answer to that can't be to ignore uh, you know some of those concerns, but at the same time, like you said, if you would address them. Uh, in a populist way, perhaps that could be a little bit short-sighted or, you know, foregoing the benefits of, you know, longer-term international cooperation. Uh, and, you know, certainly some of these movements, uh, you know, aren't exactly appealing to the uh, most noble parts of human nature. Uh, so I think I think that maybe is, is the root of some of the challenges. Is that is that something you've seen as well, Armand? Yeah, I, um, I, I agree um, that... Uh, Again, we have seen from the vaccine distribution crisis of how populists, uh, you know, are trying to keep some of uh, our first, you know, needs are more important than the global needs. But we live in a such an interconnected world. Um, and again, the, 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 the last pandemic is just a great example of how, you know, we all going to benefit if we work together uh, in terms of decisions, in terms of sharing of information, in, in terms of sharing vaccines, politics, decisions, um, there is no question that if uh, each of the countries would have uh, think only internally to the benefit of their own citizens, we will not be where we are today in terms of control of the crisis. Um, it's a small example, but it is the same in terms of everything else, from climate change to global taxation. Uh, and the last, uh, you know, uh, G7 meeting is another example of, you know, leadership uh, taking an issue at global scale um, to find problems. Local problems can be solved by global solutions. Um, and I just hope so. 
definitely facing uh, bigger problems that cannot be solved with populism and with local minds. Um, and, and with the mobility and with the new generation of Malayan, the new technology, um, I think that, and I hope that the next generation of leaders uh, will have a completely different mindset um, of less owning, more sharing with less of us and more about, um, you know, the global community. And uh, technology has a lot to play with it, you know, and, and again, some of the questions uh, that uh, the big uh, digital media are playing and, uh, you know, in, in terms of spreading populism and retracting some of their decisions is an example that even their leaders are taking notes of some of the mistakes they have done uh, and uh, are, are trying to, you know, uh, change some of the rules even though, you know, other people might say this is not fair and it's not uh, freedom of speech, but it is for the better good of society that needs to be done. Well, you know, it, it, it's interesting, um, you know, to, to hear really a, a defense of uh, globalization, a defense of, you know, kind of integration, because over the past few years, uh, it seemed so fashionable uh, to, to go against it. And you've seen, you know, kind of the populist tide rising. Uh, but the truth is, and it's a great point about the vaccines uh, and some of the cooperation there, that I think people have really started to take for granted uh, that, you know, some of the populist, more inward facing movements uh, would have us lose. Um, and so I, I think you've, you've addressed this, but I want to make sure that we really get it uh, a little bit, you know, more fleshed out, even if we can, is, is the importance of moving beyond populism for healthy societies with a real vision for the future. How does, how does you know, this kind of international perspective or a global perspective help a society be the best version of itself? It is a, it is a vision where I think leaders have to first, you know, uh, picture themselves in, um, in, in, a sh in a longer term than just gaining the next vote or the next election. It is really what is best for society in the long run and not for their political uh, individual agenda or their party agenda. Um, uh, again, an example of, of Germany, where I'm based right now for the last uh, 12 months, of CDU and Merkel, you know, taking a stand for the migration since 2015, letting millions of people entering Germany, provoking, you know, an extreme right populism against it, uh, and knowing very well that that's a price you, you know, Merkel has to pay and, and the CDU has to pay, but it is the right thing to do. Um, and, you know, even maybe in the short term of two, three years, um, people were saying that was the biggest mistake of, of their, you know, policy. Today, we're, we're looking at it differently. And recent local elections just uh, for the last 48 hours show that actually CDU is stronger than, than people thought. Uh, it's an example, as, as I said, of um, zooming out, you know, and, and really looking at the big picture. Um, because migration always uh, uh, contributes to labor, to public uh, to economic growth, uh, to development of society, but only if you look at it in the long term, if you look at it over the span of the first generation of migrants, second generation of migrants. Um, and uh, the same thing with environment, you know, Green Party in Germany around the world are gaining um, a, a lot of, uh, you know, popular votes because society, new generation are very concerned about the state of our environment. Um, and it is in a crisis, so sometimes crisis could take out the best in us and the worst in us. Um, and we have to find a balance where, um, you know, extreme environment protection uh, is never too good, it's never too bad, it's always uh, the right thing to do. Um, however, balancing it with, you know, economic growth and prosperity for the country um, is, uh, is a fine economic um, act that politicians have to balance. Um, so, uh, again, in, in, in the public eye of, uh, of society, I believe that um, anything extreme is not good. Anything that is balanced, is more centered, has uh, the privilege of seeing a long, long view in terms of decisions, politics, um, will contribute to society more in the, in the, in the future than the short-term extreme uh, views. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Armand, as, as somebody who uh, you know, has, has been an advisor to governments, who's been a partner, uh, worked closely with, with you know, some of these organizations and some of these leaders, um, you know, maybe you can speak without using specifics, uh, but just to, to share a little bit with folks who might not be uh, as familiar with those dynamics, you know, like myself, like many in the audience, um, what, what are they seeing? Uh, what are some of the concerns or the considerations that they have uh, when it comes to balancing 
you know, that, that short term uh, challenge with the longer term needs and the health of the, of the society? Great question. Um, I have worked with some extremes in terms of politicians over the last 15 years. Um, and uh, I started my career in Canada, where um, at, at the time of, of my beginning, the Conservative Party uh, had won elections. And uh, uh, they're more populist and, you know, went against a lot of the migration policies Canada has been really uh, based on and built on. Um, and in the last uh, seven years, as you know, we have a new uh, leader, which uh, you know I call from my generation. Uh, we went to the same schools, uh, and I'm proud to say that you know he has changed the way Canada looks to the world, and the world looks to Canada. And he, you know, became nearly a rock star uh, prime minister uh, with his uh, looks, his view, and yes, it did cost him you know votes left and right, and 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 sometimes he wasn't that popular as. as he was more popular outside of Canada than in Canada in, in many of the decisions that he took. But again, he, he took stance um, in, in terms of migration and opening door policy um, like, you know, uh, like his father 25 years ago. Um, because again, liberals are in Canada are, are standing for, 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 for these values in society that are, are very important. Um, you know, in Europe, you have a mixed, again, uh, I, I talked about Merkel, but there are other leaders in Europe who, uh, um, you know, are from the older guard of generation who have uh, different views on, on migration or on, on environment. But again, Macron is, is the equivalent of, you know, of Trudeau in Europe, uh, young, uh, uh, energetic with, with vision on, on, uh, on environment and openness. Um, so there is not an easy solution uh, and again depending on when crisis hits in in the political lifespan of the politicians he might take the risk to do what is right or he might decide to do what is safe um, but as in any other you know business even though politics is not business uh, sometimes you know there is a benefit of not playing safe and taking risks uh, on the long term that could you know bring in longer than one or two terms uh, whenever it's allowed so um, you know, I, uh, uh, we have seen from uh, a lot of countries who are in between, you know, in, in Eastern Europe, between the influence of Russia and the United States or the European Union, uh, you know, battling to find their own grounds uh, between these pressures. Uh, and, uh, yeah, some, some, some are taking risk and stand for what they think is right for their country. Uh, but they're feeling the hit from, from you know, um, one side of, of lobbyists or, or history partners that uh, are, are not happy with the direction some of the Balkan countries are taking, going more towards Europe and, and, and West. Um, and, um, yeah, again, I think the social media plays in a crucial role of, um, you know, really spinning out and, and emphasizing uh, some of these decisions uh, uh, on populism. And it's very important to be able to control that. Um, because it's you know it's it could play out and it could be used in a in a way that not everybody's conscious of of, uh, of the power of social media um, and the way that it can be tricked um, and influence you know the mindset of, of you know many citizens around the world on elections. Yeah, absolutely. I, I want to come back to uh, that that topic of, of technology, but but before we go there, uh, just one other question. You know, you, you mentioned something about, uh, you know, Trudeau's work to change the way that, you know, Canada sees the world and the world sees Canada, uh, which, which speaks to the broader point that, you know, these national identities uh, aren't really static. You know, they're always changing. And, uh, you know, the countries stand for certain things, uh, you know, values, some of them stay the same, some of them change. But uh, I was curious if, if in your career you've seen uh, some of these questions taking on a, a generational uh, dynamic where, you know, previous generations uh, see the country as, as having one identity and even one, uh, you know, kind of populist goal, uh, whereas the next generation sees things a little bit differently. Uh, it, it feels like we're in a bit of a dynamic period uh, for that at, at the moment in terms of how, you know, the, the future of a nation is being defined uh, in a lot of countries. And I was wondering if you could speak to that a bit, if that's something that you've, uh, that you've, that you've observed. Well, I haven't seen many generations as being still young <laughs> until. So, uh, uh, but I, uh, I think you and I are, are seeing the end of the baby boomers, you know, uh, as a generation controlling a lot of the political stage 
and uh, the the generation X taking over, which is you know uh, those uh, politicians from Australia, France, Canada, um, Austria, where you have the, the new blood of uh, new kind of uh, leaders coming in stage and, and having a completely different mindset uh, than than those who are you know uh, over sixty um, and. I don't see that we're going to see the major difference in politics until the millennials really hit the power. Uh, and with Greta, it's something that we we uh, we already have a taste of what is going to be in the next 15 to 20 years when um, uh, her friends will take power in some of the countries and 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 where they will take them. Um, so uh, I I think that the generation X is our generation is really a transition between what the you know baby boomers have. Uh, have laid out for us as a as a future, um, but it's uh, it's not a drastic change um, as much as I think the next generation that will start from 2030 2040 taking over political scene in many countries, uh, where I think you know they've been born with a completely different reality than us, uh, with technology being part of uh, you know pretty much their birthright. Um, and uh, by then even, you know, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll reach out other other heights, other technology tools, and um, we'll accelerate the, the sharing of information, the control of information. Um, so, yeah, I think that um, the, the, the radical change in political decisions is yet to come from, from the next generation of, of ours. Yeah, that, that's a that's a great point. Uh, a lot of the technological change and and you know people growing up in a, in a very different world, uh, technologically, geopolitically, uh, are really going to start starting from a, a different framework than than perhaps some of us we can imagine. Uh, and so I wanted to first uh, invite the audience. I think we've already had an extremely rich uh, series of topics coming up. Uh, so if there's anything that we'd like to dive more into, uh, please feel free to post a comment, uh, or I can hand over the mic. Uh, but we'd love to invite that, or, or as you're thinking about that, uh, Armand, maybe we could speak a little bit about you know, the role of technology. Uh, certainly technology, the big tech companies uh, have come in for some criticism, some you know, pretty well-deserved uh, for how they've handled uh, you know, the, the shifting of information uh, as it becomes kind of more politically sensitive. And uh, certainly the populist uh, challenges are a big part of that. You know, what information deserves to be shared, what's disinformation, what's a different perspective? Uh, and I was wondering, what's your, your sense of that? Uh, in terms of what that means for for the rise and the spread of populist movements, uh, and maybe what's the better way to, to handle that going forwards, uh, because technology is not going away. Yeah, it's, it's it's not going away. It's become an even bigger part of us until eventually it will be one with us. Um, but in the meantime, yes, big technology companies are uh, responsible. They have uh, they have to be accountable for for the tools that they have. And I think we're just awakening to the power of those tools. Uh, Cambridge Analytica was really the first uh, example of how big data can be used um, in in a political way. Um, and and uh, I think many other countries are taking note of of that um, and starting to use it. Um, and only you know aware citizens can require from technology companies some accountability um so institutions like the european union have started to do that um other international bodies are, are requesting more transparency on, on politically funded campaigns uh and we're seeing this you know and in, in from instagram to facebook and and uh, linkedin where um, any political messages are, are are being posted that um you know they need to be authorized and etc so I think there was a there was an opportunity for populists that uh, at the beginning uh, people were not aware, so they really uh, used it. Um, and with uh, the U.S. elections and with Cambridge Analytica scandal and Facebook, I think uh, there was a wake up call uh, for a lot of people, and uh, things have started to move into more controlled, regulated way. We're not there yet. I believe that we still have a lot to uh, to increase and to improve in, in, in that sphere. Um, but again, technology can be used the same way for, for good reasons. So um, it's uh, absolutely right to uh, benefit from it and to look for um, other tools and solutions that are out there to increase the message on climate change, on uh, a positive uh, migration outlook, um, on cooperation on the global level, uh, like for the pandemic and the vaccine distribution and etc. So 
um, let's not shut it down because somebody has used it in the wrong way. Opposite, let's try to control it to make sure that it's used by the right people for the right way. And uh, this is what uh, I, I hope for the next generation to uh, to master better than us. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, that, that's definitely uh, got to be high on the list in terms of uh, what would what would turn the tide of, of some of these societies and, and really making it feel uh, like we're going somewhere healthy. Um, one one question I wanted to uh, ask a little bit about about you know the relative uh, importance of some of these institutions uh, in in driving this kind of positive change. So you've got uh, you know leaders, certainly kind of government leaders, elected leaders. Uh, who, who have a role to play in, you know, setting the tone uh, of the politics for the country, uh, a sense of where things are going, uh, so they construct of something safe. But then you've also got, you know, some of these commercial institutions, uh, multinational companies, uh, big tech companies that operate across borders. Uh, and then you've got, you know, the, the big global institutions uh, like the United Nations, for example, uh, that have, you know, kind of their own mandate that, uh, you know, perhaps is, is uh, a little bit, you know, uh, antithetical to, to some of the populist uh, ideas that are happening, but but can't avoid them either. And so uh, I was wondering if you could speak to, you know, what you think the relative importance is of elected political leaders, uh, multinational companies and, and institutions, uh, and then perhaps, you know, some of the institutions that have been the hallmark uh, of the globalist era that, that we've, uh, you know, been in uh, for the past 20 or so years. That's a great question. Um, I haven't thought about it. I think definitely populism has used the weaknesses of this global institution to uh, show that they're no longer relevant. Um, so again, uh, bringing back to where you are based now in the States, uh, you know, we have seen the last administration, you know, exiting in a very grandos way, these institutions uh, saying that they don't work anymore um, to bring a lot of populism and nationalism um, in, in uh it didn't pay out. Um, at the end, I think, uh, in the long term, this institution do play a role. Are they efficient? Maybe not enough, but uh, they definitely have a role in society. Um, and in, in the interconnectivity of the world we live in, we need these kind of institutions. From the WHO's role in, in the pandemic, to the UN, to the OECD, uh, you need these, you know, international guardians of values, of rules, of uh, protecting the law uh, and, and the rights of citizens around the world um, where, yeah, some countries could take, you know, international stance for, uh, for, for, for the right thing to do and, and human rights. Uh, we're seeing the United States, you know, using the Magnitsky law, which is, as you know, Magnitsky law, which is, you know, uh, their right to go and, and sanction people in other countries because they have infringed human rights violation. Um, and uh, some big countries are, are you know, have this power and tool that uh, they're using, but I think these international organizations are better fit to uh, to do it in a more independent way without creating, um, you know, the partisan side that uh, people will will always talk if it's a single country taking a stand on an issue. Um, so again, I believe that these countries and these uh, sorry international organizations we're talking about uh, uh, need a revamp, and and that will come through technology, that will come through the next generation of leaders where their efficiency and reach will be accelerated and increased um, because right now they, they don't function at their best, let's put it that way. But are they needed? Absolutely. Yeah, I want to uh, zoom in a little bit uh, to the, the personal side of things, so the individual. Uh, you know, because certainly I think, you know, we're, we're shaped, our lives are shaped uh, to a great extent by the media environment we find ourselves in, uh, the messages that leaders have for us about, you know, who we are, what we're doing, uh, you know, as a, as a, as a people, uh, you know, as, a, as global citizens. Uh, and I think it's been something, you know, over the past few years, uh, we've all noticed that, that messaging has become more intense uh, and, and sharper in some ways, more challenging. And I was wondering, as, as somebody who, you know, keeps an eye on these things and, and certainly has a, a strong vision you know, for a connected uh, global citizenry, uh, how do you deal with this personally? What would you advise other people do in terms of, you know, kind of tuning out some of these messages uh, and how can they contribute, you know, to healthier uh, discourse and kind of a healthier information environment uh, around, you know, some of these, these large scale issues from a personal level? Um, great question. And I, I hope some of uh, the participants can, can jump in and, and say how they feel about it. Um, Again, from my personal experience being born on different continents and uh, living in, in uh, five countries in the last uh, 40 years, 
um, I, I, I needed to adapt and, um, you know, speak the language and embrace the cultures and, and religions of countries where um, I, I have been welcomed. And as an Armenian, you know, I think my grandparents have been doing this for, for the last 10 generations in order to survive. Um, so maybe I have it in the DNA more than others, but I think having an open mind um, and uh, being a little bit of chameleon and being able to adapt to wherever you are, uh, home is not a place, it's really a feeling. And, and uh, it's something that uh, I have grown up and I hope I got to transmit that to, to, my, um, to my kids um, because uh, the way that our grandparents have probably grow up into a same place, same city, born, live and die, uh, and having roots is not longer going to be the future of, of how citizens around the world will live. Uh, chances are, uh, you know, 50% of the people will not die in the same country where they're born uh, in the future. So that requires certain um, characters, certain uh, ability uh, to adapt. And uh, I think technology and populism are, are one of these things that people have to until they're not aware themselves, until they don't take the right uh, measures of, you know, uh, fact-checking and, and doing their own research um, and questioning, you know. It, it's not because it's on CNN or it's Fox is right. Um, you know, you really have to, uh, you have to do a little bit of a further dig um, and, and, and find out, you know, why is there? Is it paid? Is it not? Um, and and uh, so question more, uh, research, have an open mind, um, adapt, and uh, and move on because I think that's uh, that's going to be the, the key to survive. And uh, is the new Darwinism. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, I, that, that's a great point. I think um, you know we might have uh, taken for granted uh, in some ways over these past couple decades this idea that. Um, you know, if you if you pay attention to something kind of critically, uh, it's it's the truth, and you can kind of bank on it. Uh, but I think over these past you know few decades, uh, people have have really seen, and I think you know I can speak as, as an American. Um, people have seen that you know that's actually not always the right way to be. It's not always the safest. Uh, sometimes there's issues you know that don't necessarily have your best interest at heart when it comes to uh, advertising dollars and when it comes to uh, you know really getting people ginned up about about certain concepts. Uh, for the benefit of the producer, not the benefit of the of the viewer, uh, and you know it, it's challenging because if you've got to uh, look at you know everything with a critical eye, it, it can get a bit exhausting. Uh, but at the same time, you know, unfortunately, there's really no alternative because uh, you know, like you said, some of these uh, you know messages are, are really designed for the for, for them and, and might not put the individual where they really want to end up uh, emotionally or, or spiritually or uh, in their in their business. So so that's a, that's a great point. Uh, I wanted to see if, if anybody from the audience uh, would like to chime in or comment uh, either on anything that Armand has shared uh, or with a question of their own. Uh, I've, I've been enjoying the discussion, but I, I don't want to monopolize it. Uh, if anybody's got uh, a comment or a question here, uh, we want to leave some time for that. Or Armand, if uh, you've got a question you know, or, or, uh, or anything that you'd like to get in with, uh, that we haven't mentioned yet, uh, also would be a great time. We've only got... Uh, eight minutes left. You know, it's not long. It flies by. Yeah, I would like to hear um, a little bit from from the audience or, or you, uh, your perspective of um, what should be the rules uh, in in terms of um, the new social contract that I think we have to subscribe because anything old um, of uh, of you know being citizen of a single country, uh, you know, uh, swearing into a, a constitution of a single country is no longer going to be the norm. We are all going to be living displaced um, from your example in China to uh, Miami from mine. And I'm sure that all, anybody who is listening. Uh, so how do you, you know, how do you really subscribe to, to a politics of a, of a country? Uh, do you call yourself really a citizen of, a, of that country or, or your vision and your personal contract is it's more important in terms of, you know, um, society as, as general? Um, and uh, such a constitution doesn't exist for global citizens, but you know, if it does, um, what should be the key elements of, of our responsibility as citizens of this planet um, on a bigger scale than our promises to a single country? That, that's, that's a great question. It's a big question. Uh, we've got a couple comments from uh, Samantha. Uh, intersectionality is the new norm. Uh, Samantha, can I, can I toss you the mic? 
Uh, I think you've got to request it if so. Uh, but you mentioned a book, uh, How We Win uh, by Farah Panditha. Uh, we, can, we can look for that one. Um, intersectionality, uh, absolutely. It's, uh, like you mentioned, Armand, it's something that... Um, uh, Samantha is asking how to uh, take mic. So I don't know if yep. you can. Okay, no, cool. I think I think I just hit the button here. Perfect. Uh, as as Samantha's uh, hopping on, I, I would I would just introduce one other kind of twist here, which is uh, I think Armand, what you mentioned uh, about you know the, the changing nature of nations and borders uh, is is big in the West. Uh, I wonder if it's as true, you know, for some of the Eastern uh, countries. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I spent I spent 10 years in China. I feel like they've got, uh, you know, a very strong uh, view of, of, of the nation uh, in a way that, that the West may be a little bit less so. But I, we can get into that maybe, but I uh, would love to hear from uh, from Samantha. I was not expecting to be on camera. So I just up a run. Um, no, I think that I work in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. And I think the, the there's a lack of understanding. Like, it's not just about race, gender, disability. Like, it's also about culture and about identity being so much more nuanced than um, just your race, just your gender, that we are you know so many of us are global citizens like i think armand's point that you know you might be born in one country and die in another and get married in another and do your studies in another country right and that we are kind of global citizens that you know intersect all of these cultural norms and how do we navigate that when you don't fit into one category um uh, that's what I think about in the work I do. And then just with regards to Populum, Farrah Pandit wrote a great book called How We Win. I just interviewed her. I have a talk show on um, global politics. But she talks a lot about how we have to have a social media contract and how the private sector needs to get involved in overcoming populism and how Google needs to intercept people that are searching for you know, how to become a terrorist with mental health therapy. Um, yeah, anyway, those are my brief, not thought out comments for today. Thank you for sharing the mic and thank you for both of your comments. Cool, thank, thank you. you. Very cool. Uh, yeah, okay, so I, I think I think we're reaching toward a uh, new social contract. Uh, that's that's what, uh, and you know, I, I let me let me say something. Um, I'd be curious, uh, Armand, for your, for your perspective on this. Um, you know, it, I feel like it has to, there's a lot of problems in the world, big problems. Uh, that we kind of put on people, we put on individuals. Uh, I think a, a great one, for example, uh, is you know climate change. Uh, whereas what you really get instead of uh, can you all hear me? I'm yeah, sorry. Judge Rakoff, welcome. How are you? Oh, thank you. Uh, Judge, so so um, we've been uh, we've been on with uh, with Armand here talking about uh, the subject of overcoming populism. Uh, Judge Rakoff uh, is with us. Uh, Southern District of New York uh, recently wrote uh, a book exploring uh, the role of, of the courts uh, in America in justice and, and kind of where, you know, to some extent they, they've been, uh, you know, perhaps falling short. Uh, his book is Why the Innocent Plead Guilty. I'm, I'm uh, getting, guilty give me free. for a second. I'm getting um, echo in your voice. I'm not quite sure why. Um, is there anything you can do at your end? I'm, uh, let's try it now. Okay. Uh, Are there other people plugged in and maybe that's what's doing it? Sounds like it's okay now. Yeah, it is okay now. Great. Terrific. Okay. Thank you. Um, cool. Well, uh, well, well, welcome judge. Uh, it's, it's great to have you on with us. Um, My pleasure. Yeah. uh, so we, we're, uh, we, we were going to uh, actually, unfortunately, wrap up uh, pretty soon here, but um, let's, let's extend if, uh, if, if we're all available for a few minutes, Judge, just so you can uh, share some of your, your comments uh, and remarks on, on the topic of uh, overcoming populism. Um, one, one question uh, I'd like to, to put to you just to share your views uh, with, with the audience uh, and with, with Armand um, is, uh, you know, you, you've written uh, critically constructive criticism uh, of the the nature uh, of the justice system in America and uh, how it's developed and and some of the uh, ways that it's perhaps uh, diverged from its original uh, intentions in terms of the way that that uh, justice is is meted out 
uh, in the country. And I was wondering if you could uh, share how you think that development uh, has perhaps influenced the rise of some of these populist movements, uh, if you think there's any relationship there. Yeah, I think there's an indirect relationship, but just quickly to first establish the situation in the United States. In the last half of the 20th century, the United States was experiencing great increases in crime. And both Congress and the state legislatures passed very harsh laws, um, in hindsight, really much too harsh. And they have had a number of very unfortunate effects, uh, the most obvious of which is mass incarceration. We lead the world by a substantial margin in the number of people we have in prison, over 2 million people uh, every year. Then um, it also led to, in order to avoid the harshest of the penalties, uh, people began no longer going to trial, but plea bargaining. So plea bargaining now accounts for 97% uh, of all criminal dispositions in the United States, which puts the power essentially in the hands of the prosecutor rather than the judge. And the third unfortunate uh, aspect was that the penalties were so high that even uh, a fair number of innocent people pled guilty just to avoid the risk that they might be convicted of and and uh, have to face very, very long prison sentences.